Good morning. We are in a series looking at God's questions to us. We've said that we have many questions for God, good questions. The Bible has numerous questions that God's people are asking Him, but by the very nature that God is God and we are not, His questions are greater than our questions. And if He's asking His people questions, then His people should sit up and listen and understand what God is asking. Now, I think this, this series looking at God's questions is good because it is biblical, and it's good because it's applicable. We look at this and say, God is asking us questions. But as we continue in this series, which we'll be in for a couple more weeks, it's a reminder to think about how we come to read Scripture also. When we come to read Scripture, our primary focus is not what I need to do. If we come to Scripture thinking about what it is that I need to do, we kind of skim through the Bible looking for bullet points and action items. I want this result. What do I need to do to get over there? How do I do that? How do I fix that? And if you think about a lot of the modern blogs, websites, even stuff geared towards Christians, even a lot of our resources, it's kind of set up that way. Ten things you need to do to follow the Lord better this year. Six things to improve your marriage. Five ways to be the parent you're supposed to be. And you skim down and you read all these bullet points, right? You check them off. But that's not how we are to read the Bible. Our focus should first and foremost be upon God. Who is this God that we encounter? Who is he? What is he like? What is he interested in? What does he want? What does he desire? What is his character like? For example, today, right now, our kids downstairs are going to be learning about the kindness of David. That's the way it's titled. But the end and where it's all going is to teach the children what is the kindness of God? What is the kindness of God? And if parents go home today and disciple their children with the handout and say, you need to be more kind like David, we've kind of missed the point. They should be kind like David. But our eyes and our children's eyes should be drawn to the God who is kind and then respond to him, respond to him for who he is, for what he does, the way he wants so today we have this scripture of Hagar, and Hagar encounters God, and she's kind of blown away by who God is. What's his character like? What kind of God is this? He sees, he hears, he directs, he blesses, he knows me. And then she responds. She responds to that. So in a series of questions, and we, last week had the question, where are you? looking at Genesis 3 and Adam and Eve, and today we come to Genesis 16, looking at this question, where are you going? There was a time when I was about maybe five, we lived in Texas in this ranch house, and we had these connecting, this bathroom that connected my sister's bedroom to my brother and my bedroom, and that was useful on this occasion because I did something bad. I don't remember what it was, but I did something bad, and my mom was after me. And I was going get, to get it. So my sister came into the bathroom and we locked both the doors. So she couldn't get in. My sister's two years older than me. And the good news was I had this sister, and still have, praise God, that wanted to protect me and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to help you in this running away thing you're doing. That was the good news. The bad news was for rations, we had this snack-sized bag of Fritos and sink water. So... We didn't hold off too long, and I got what was coming to me, and my sister couldn't stop it. This question comes to us today in two parts from God. It's really a question of where have you been, where are you running from, and where are you running to? Where are you going? Where are you going? How are you dealing with people? How are you dealing with life? How are you dealing with God? How are you obeying? How are you believing? How are you trusting? How are you following God's revealed word? How are you responding 
to this kind, gracious, hearing, seeing, loving God. To what he has said to us, to what he has done for us. Where are you going? Where are you going in your marriage? Where are you going in your career? Where are you going in your parenting, in your grandparenting? Most importantly, where are you going in your relationship with the living God today? Where are you heading? Where are you going? As we come to this question, we come to the situation and the context. We read all of chapter 16, and this is the Abram and Sarai that God has set apart as a people. And the situation is, right before this in chapter 15, God has given them a most amazing promise, a most amazing and even dramatic display of his covenant with them. And he tells Abram, I'm going to bless you and through you bless all the nations of the world. And Abram says, how? I don't even have any children. And God says, you will have a child. And it will be through this child, really from you, that this will happen. And he tells him to go outside, look up at the stars, and tells him, you will have more than that. And not only will you have a people, but you will have a land that I am giving to you that will belong to them. This is an important promise. It's an amazing promise. It's foundational in Scripture. We're told that Abraham had great faith, and he believed that. That's what chapter 15 tells us. But then we get to chapter 16 in this word, now. Now. And it's important to know that this chapter 16 connects back to chapter 3. Sin has entered the world. Man and woman have disobeyed God, and there has been the great fall of humanity where there is separation between Humanity in itself, humanity in creation, and humanity and its creator, God. And people are on the run and hiding. But God has given this promise through Abraham in his way to begin his great rescue plan that he will answer the defilement, the sin, the rebellion that has entered into this world. It is through This line through Abraham that when the Savior comes that God will right what was lost in Eden and restore his image bearers, will save, redeem. And God is moving throughout all of history and through the line of the Bible, the main story, the big story of the Bible is this story, that God is purposing He is moving, he is calling, he is saving, he is establishing, he is redeeming, he's restoring to bring his people back to the way that they should be, to restore the image of God in them and the union with God, that humanity will live out its purpose to worship God, to serve God, to fellowship with God. But then we come to Chapter 16, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now God said all of that, but now none of it's happened. None of it's happened. Doesn't look like the promise is working out for them. Sarai has no children. There is no heir, but she has a plan. I have no children, she's thinking, but I have this servant, named Hagar. She has a plan. And into this situation, she says to her husband, behold now. Back in chapter 15, God spoke to Abram and said, when Abram had doubts, he said, behold, I will make this happen. Now Sarai Sarai says, behold, it's not happening. But behold now, the Lord has prevented me from having children. The Lord has prevented me. The Lord has done this, so we better get on with it if this thing's going to get done at all. Well, it's very true that God opens and closes wombs. Here, Sarai's words seem to implicate God. It is this Yahweh God who has restrained me 
from making the promise come true. So I could be thinking it's her job to find an answer. How is this covenant promise going to happen? That thing about stars. And she's so desperate, it seems, to provide an heir to her husband, to be the wife she feels she should be, to be the mother that she should be, that she's even going to give Hagar to her own husband. Now, a note there as we stop and think about it, we know from ancient history that barrenness and infertility was a very, very big deal. We can see this in all the gods that were set up, fertility gods, and if you did this and did that, they would bring upon not just rain, but children to you. And to be barren in the ancient world was a dangerous position to be in, and it was a despised position. Today, women who cannot conceive children can have all kinds of feelings of depression, of feeling less than, of what could be, that they can't bring forth children. They can't be the mom maybe they want to be or feel they should be. They can't be the wife that they would like to be. That's a heavy burden to have. But in the ancient world, that was even added upon that people in society would look down on you that you are barren. Maybe it's a curse from the gods. You have done something wrong. And this is payment for that. And a wife who could not produce children could be seen very much as a useless wife. And in a dangerous position, there's no heir. There's no one to help you farm. There's no one to help you shepherd. There is no social security You have no children. You have no caretakers. Who's going to take care of your family? Who's going to protect you and watch out for you? I hope we understand the Bible's great nuance. We understand from the context that when we think about the sin of this, Sarai and Abram have done something wrong. But if we put ourselves in her shoes for a moment, what must have taken for her to be this desperate? to want this so desperately, to feel that she must have this so desperately that she would do something that seems so counterintuitive to a wife, to give her husband to another woman, to give another woman to her husband. What would it take for her to be that desperate? Perhaps Sarai just doesn't want to be the person who stopped the promise from happening. I mean, she says, I'm the problem. This hasn't happened Let us fix it. And so she says to her, and the solution, go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Very literally, it says, go into her that I might be built up by her, that I might be established by her, that I might build up this family, complete this promise through her. This is a surrogate type of arrangement says later that she's giving Hagar to Abram as a wife. She would not be a wife on the same status as Sarai. She would be a concubine. She would be a lesser wife. When I ministered in Thailand and in L.A. with Thai people, this still happens. They translate it in Thailand literally as the little wife. You're the little wife. But you're not the queen mother. You're not the major wife. This is what happened. But she tells him that we are going to fix this. Go in that I might obtain children, that we might finish this promise. This is a surrogate relationship in this culture. When Hagar had this child, it would not be her child. It would belong to Sarai and Abram. It would be his heir. It would be counted as their child. She would just be birthing this for them. And this was the culture's answer to infertility in some cases especially in nobility, and to have an heir that would pass on. This is the answer of culture. It's practical. Why not do this? God's prevented this. God's not moving. God hasn't shown up. We got to do this ourselves. Do you hear that in your own heart sometimes? And the echo that comes with it, well, culture says it's perfectly okay. This is how people handle this. This is how people do this. Brothers and sisters, even when our culture says this is how we fix problems or this is legal, doesn't always mean it's God's way. 
especially when it comes to pregnancy. So they have a solution to the situation, which ends up in sin. Verse 3, so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now, this is application upon application for us. You know, when we think about a word of God that has come, if you believe God has given you a promise that has told you something, and most definitely when that promise comes verifiable in his word, where is the line that we know that we need to get up and do something or we keep waiting upon the Lord? See, here they've waited 10 years. That's a reasonable amount of time, isn't it? Have you prayed for something for 10 years? Have you, have you given up? Said, no, I, it's, this is not going to happen. I need to take things into my own hand. I need to move on. And for, for them, maybe they thought it was also, well, this hasn't happened because we're not in the land yet. But now they've been in the land 10 years. So what's going on? We are called to be people of action by God. Abram was called. Leave there, go there. Do this. Trust me. God was calling Abram to action, but the struggle is waiting on the Lord and trusting and obeying to act in the way that is godly, the way that God wants. We are called to do things for God, but we are called to not overstep like Adam and Eve what we should not do, where we should not go, what we should not touch, not to act too soon. And not to be cowards in hesitation either. It seems to be in this story that is part of God's plan that he has delayed to mature their trust in him and to clearly reveal himself. All believers struggle with the timing of divinely promised events. But we need to seek wisdom to trust God and to have faith that the Lord's plans will pass and we won't try to bring them about too hastily by our own hands. In short, we need to not fall, brothers and sisters, for the widespread but unbiblical saying that God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who wait upon the Lord. Who wait upon the Lord. And in fact, trying to move too soon and force God's hand can actually have disastrous results. We know about people trying to push Jesus to be their king, and he keeps saying, it's not my time. It's not my time. You go back to the story of a guy named Moses who sees the injustice and knows somewhat of the plan of God to free Israel from the Egyptians and from slavery, but he takes matters in his own hands, ends up killing an Egyptian. And then ends up on the run for 40 years. This is part of the narrative of the Bible as God has given promises to his people. But they don't really like his word or his timing. God comes to a certain guy named Naaman and says, this is how you're going to be clean. Go to that river and dip this many times. And he says, that's too small. I'm a general. Then he goes to his own people, Israel, and says, this is the land I've set apart for you. You go and take it. And they said, no, 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 that's too big. They look like giants. Other times the response is, that's too hard. That's too easy. That's too simple. That's too complex. That's too slow. Not now, God. The great lesson for us is to wait upon the Lord and go when he says go. And continue to wait upon him. This is a great application for any who are serving God through the church in any type of ministry that God has given you to do. Let's continue to wait upon him. Sometimes there's a lot of haste in ministry to say, God gave our church this vision. God told us to do this, but it's not happening. We need to hurry up and make it so. We need to be careful with that. I've personally been in different churches and so many meetings, and it seems to be the message, hey, 
Let's hurry up and finish this prayer thing so we can get on to the real business. We got planning to do. We got to make things happen. But our urge should always be, let's wait upon the Lord and hear from him. That's what's missing from this story of Abram and Sarai. We don't see that in any of this. And the narrator hasn't just omitted it. There's a lesson. They have not sought the Lord. It's been 10 years. Let's move. Or it's been 10 years. Let's ask the Lord what we should do. I suffered at a particular time in ministry and I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I was praying probably up to that point more than I'd ever prayed about a single thing. And then I got the light at the end of the tunnel. God was doing something. But my father, who was a minister, told me, you know, Kyle, you remember that time when you were on your knees and you didn't know what was happening and you felt helpless? That's where God really wants you every single day of your ministry. Every single day. There's no doubt God has given you gifts. He's given you skills. He blessed Abram and Sarai with faith, with possessions. But we need to work in ministry and work for the Lord, constantly remembering, in a way, our own barrenness, our own deadness, that in our own flesh, in our own willpower, we cannot build God's church. We cannot bring his plans across. Israel is going to stumble that way, and we see here Abram and Sarai stumbling. And that's the sin, trying to take the things into their own hands and not waiting upon the Lord in faithfulness. What's really under this is trying to answer our deepest needs ourselves. Try to answer our deepest lack with our own resources trying to make a way for ourselves to feel better, to feel accepted, to feel whole, to feel good, to feel like the people we think we should be in our own wisdom, not by God's word. And all around us at the same time is culture's answer saying, do this, do that, it'll work. Verse 4, 5, 6, And he went to Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now Hagar is looking down her nose at her mistress because she has been able to conceive. She looks at Sarai, you're not that much of a woman, not like me. You're not that kind of wife, not like me. I'm producing. I'm fertile. I'm bringing this promise across. You can imagine Sarai's feeling. She's Not angry in one sense that the conception has happened. That's kind of what she wanted. That's what she planned. But she's not happy how this is turning out. Now she's being looked down upon, and this woman, her servant, has the thing that she wants most in this world, it seems like, to conceive a child, to bring this promise forward. So she turns back on Abram. May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. So he gives him a kind of idiom. Maybe God will deal with you. God's going to get you. God sees what you've done, Abram. God's going to judge you. She could be angry as well that Abram is not doing what he should do, even in this surrogate cultural relationship, but he's treating Hagar as the first wife. He's egging this whole problem on. So in addition to the adultery and the unfaithfulness, there is mistreatment, there is abuse, there is estrangement, there is distance that's growing in this couple's marriage because they've tried to take this into their own hands. And then what happens to our dear Abram? He says to his wife, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. So often in sin, we deflect and pass it on to somebody else. He says, It's your servant. You do with her what you want. It's your problem. I'm not dealing with this. You deal with it. Now think about this. Is Abram just as the 
the lead of this household, this woman Hagar, is in his house. But he says, I don't really care what happens to her. You deal with it. By the way, she's pregnant with his child. And he seems to have no regard for that. Especially troubling if he actually thought this child, Ishmael, was the answer to the promise. He says, yeah, Sarah, just do whatever you want. You take care of it. And unchecked, unrestrained, she just seems unloads on this woman to get revenge. She treats her so harshly. Do you catch what's going on in this story? The human solution to their situation to Sarai's barrenness has birthed more troubles than answers. It's made things worse as they've tried to take things into their own hands. Their marriage is in disaster. Their household is in disaster. Seems to be somewhat their faith towards God and his promises is on the brink of disaster. And the way they're treating others is abuse. It's ungodly. You know, at our church, we want to resource you as much as possible. So if you go on our website to the first button there, it says Our Bible Study. If you open that, you'll find a lot of resources this week and a lot of notes to talk about things we just can't and to help you in your community groups. And some of the resources you'll find is, what do we do with polygamy in the Bible? I only have time to speak on it briefly, but this is a lesson for us as well. Whenever you encounter polygamy in the Word of God, it always ends badly. There's no positive example of polygamy in the Bible. These love triangles end up in headache, heartache, murder, lying, jealousy, treachery, abandonment. It's a note for us as we are Bible readers that no matter when we see something in the Bible that is described, it's not proscribed all the time. Polygamy is mentioned in the Bible, but it doesn't mean that that is God's plan for marriage. The beginning of Genesis, we learned already that God has said that there is a one flesh union. There's between a man and a woman joined together, and there is a one flesh union. There is no other picture in the Bible for a sustainable marriage than that. When Jesus is asked about marriage, he refers back to Genesis and says, nothing's changed. It's between one man and one woman that is joined together in the intimacy. And then the picture of the New Testament of the church is that there is a God named Jesus who is the groom and his church is called his bride. He doesn't have plural brides. He has one. The picture of the church falls apart if we think polygamy is okay. It's not. Everywhere it is, it's socially, culturally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, relationally fraught with problems. God has given his way, but they've tried another. And the result is that there really is a great, great mess of things. They haven't fixed anything, have they? Trying to answer their own problems in their own hands by what culture said was the standard ends up in abuse and heartache separation. Abram has abandoned his child and the mother of that child. Sarai has abused and now she's turning against her husband. And then Hagar, she's run away. You don't have to be an expert on the ancient world. I certainly am not. But to understand that a pregnant woman running away in the wilderness of the ancient world is not a good thing. It's not like she can get services and resources at the ready. If she is alone and pregnant, she is in a dire situation. She is in a desperate situation. She is in a very, very dangerous situation. She's alone. She's abandoned. She's hurt. And she's running. It seems to be she's running and trying to take things again into her own hands. She's running back to Shur. It looks like she's running back on the way to Egypt. She's an Egyptian, and she was most likely given to Abram and Sarai when they passed through Egypt by one of the kings there. She's running home. She's running from the context that we know, a place that 
God doesn't want her to be because he tells her to go back. She's running and she's alone, but then that's where we see the great rescue here, don't we? The great rescue. God has not been on the scene. They haven't been praying to him. His name has been only used in this passage as a kind of a curse word. God will get you, Abram. But now, as this woman is desperate, she's run, and it's the angel of the Lord that has found her. Do you see the grace in this? The angel of the Lord has come to this woman when she is in emotional distress, psychological distress, physical distress, spiritual distress. The Lord finds her. What grace! That the Lord God's love and care is not only in Abram's family, but extends to this non-covenant person in a way, this Egyptian, this slave girl, this adulteress, this haughty belittler who's running away, but God finds her. God finds her. And then he asks her this amazing question. Hagar, Servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Where have you come from and where are you going? Do you see the grace in this as well in his question? And this is the great rescue that he is coming to her, speaking to her, and asking her a question. This is where the rescue of God begins. Notice that he calls her through his messenger by her name. Not a very small thing. He calls her by her name. He knows her name. And he knows her station in life. He calls her, you're running away, you're fleeing, but you are the servant of Sarai. I know who you are. And of course, God knows all things. He knows all things. He knows exactly who she is. He knows exactly where she is. He knows the whole ordeal. He knows who's guilty. He knows all the sin. He knows what's going in their heart. So why does he ask these two questions? I believe he's asking her because this two-part question probes her heart, gives her a chance to confess, and it helps her to verbalize what's really going on. What's she running from and what is she trying to do to fix it? Where have you come from? Is the question. Where have you come from? Hagar, why are you running? What's happened? Why have you left the house of Abram? What's been done to you and what have you done? What's been done to you and what have you done? Where are you going? But first he asks, where have you come from? Where have you come from? What's really going on here? And she answers, and she answers truthfully, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarai. She is. But you don't see in any part of her answer any part of confession or owning up to what's caused this problem. As you go to counsel people, as you go to help your children, as you go to help your spouse, and friends, and brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe what this angel is doing is very, very good counseling. He's asking her, what's going on here? What's the real story? What's happened? So often when we go to talk to our own friends, and our own, we take their side and quickly want to cheer them up and put our arm around them and say, it's going to be okay, and man, those people were awful to you, and how could they? Good counseling question here is to say, what's really going on? What's happened? What have you done? What are you running from? You know, sometimes I talk to people in my office and they want to start by telling me all the problems of their spouse or their children or so-and-so in church and I have to redirect because there's only one person sitting in my office and I have to say, what's going on here? What's happened? What part have you played in this? What is really happening? 
And how have people hurt you as well? And then he asked, where are you going? Where have you come from and then where are you going? She's running back to Egypt. What's really going on? What's the problem here, Hagar? And how are you trying to fix it? She says, I'm fleeing. I'm running away. How are you dealing with this? Is running the best answer here? Could be, but God's going to give her a different one. There's so much here to continue to apply during the week for your life to think about because I see people all the time running away from church. They're running away because they had a fight with someone. They're running away because they didn't like something the pastor said. They're running away because things didn't work out the way they wanted to and they're running to another church. Where are you running to? Where are you running from? In your marriage, in your career, in your parenting, and most importantly, again, in your relationship with the Lord. Where are you running to? Where are you running from? God speaks to Hagar by name, and he gives her direction through his messenger here. And she has a choice. Listen to the Lord or continue running. Trust the Lord or continue relying on herself. Continue on to Shur or go back to Sarai. What are you going to do? He says, go back. And think about that. The Lord is asking her to make a radical attitude and heart change. He's not telling her something easy to do. He's coming in and he knows her by name and he tells her, and we have to assume it's because he cares and loves her, he's telling her to go back. But think about that, to go back to a house where she has been abused and mistreated. But also go back to a boss who she has belittled, who she has been sinful towards. How is she going to do that? can assume if God's another kind of God, he might be coming to Hagar saying, yes, please, dear, keep running. You've been a nuisance to this whole promise thing of mine. Get out of the way. That's not what he says at all. He says, go back, go back, and I am going to bless you abundantly. Go back, because the Lord God has said that that is what is best for you. Now hear me, brothers and sisters, there are people in marriages trying to do all kinds of ungodly things to save their marriage. We see that a little bit here in what Sarai and Abram are doing. Christianity is not an ends justify the means religion, is it? It is follow the word of the Lord, no matter how difficult it might sound to you. God gives her a message and directs her back. There are some situations of abuse, of neglect, of adultery, that God might be telling you to get out of and run away from. What we're talking about here, though, is the clear revealed word of God to Hagar. What is she going to do when God is graciously, lovingly directing her life? God has spoken to her, and it's been clear. Sometimes, too, though, as God's word comes to us, it's direct, it's in print, it's in the Bible, and we look at it, and it comes directly to us, but we say, no, no, God, I'm waiting on another word, please. We all have a choice. God has spoken to her. God has directed her. Will she obey or will she not? I find it a little bit ironic that a lot of people in the modern church today talk about all these fresh words from God and fresh revelation, but they don't seem to much care about all the direction that God gave here and to follow that. It's clear. He told her what to do. And in great irony, she listens. Irony because the covenant couple is not listening to God's direction and God's word, it seems, and they're making a mess of things. And here is this Egyptian slave girl, this outsider. She obeys. She goes back. She listens and follows his word, and she trusts his promise. And that's where we come to the really beautiful, beautiful part here. 
is in what she sees, what she comes to understand about God that leads her to respond. He's a God who directs. He's a God who blesses in verse 10. He says, I will surely multiply your offspring. And then we read this. He is a God who hears. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Maybe Abram's not listening to you. Maybe he doesn't hear you. Maybe Sarai doesn't hear you. She's not listening to you. But you know who does? God. The messenger says, God has heard your affliction. He's heard your pain. You think no one understands? God sees it. God knows. God cares. He hears. He's the living God who hears. He's not the useless idols and false gods of all these other nations and all these other people. He hears you. He hears and he cares. It reminds you of the time that God's people were stuck in Egypt in slavery and God says, I hear the cries of my people. He is not far off. He is not distant. He hears. She has come to understand that. God hears. Imagine as she goes back and she raises Ishmael that now whenever she says his name, or at least maybe every 10th or 12th time, she says, Ishmael, Ishmael, she is pronouncing God hears, God hears. This son of mine is not just an accident. He's not a mistake that God is writing off. God hears. God's restoring. Even in my shame, he's not casting us aside. He hears me in my affliction. And she says also, he's a God who sees. He sees her. He sees her. Now, we might think this is no big deal. There's the God who's so mighty. Of course, he sees everything. But the mind-blowing part to Hagar is he sees me. He sees me. He sees a slave girl. He sees an outsider. He sees a sinner. He sees an adulteress. He sees her. He knows her by name. He sees her. She's overwhelmed that he sees her and that he cares for her. He sees her even when she's hiding. He sees her even when she's running away. He sees her even when she's lost in sin. He sees her. He sees her. So she actually shockingly gives God a name. She names him El Roy. You're the God who sees. Again, not like these little statues and these idols and these false gods. These little gods that we have to go to and beg for fertility, beg for stuff and say, I need this. Will you please give it to me? He says, God already hears you and sees you. He knows what you need. He knows your heart. He sees you. And amazing as he sees and he hears, he is also seen. He's seen. She says, truly here I have seen him. I have seen him. Some English translations include a part that says, I have seen him and I haven't died. Or I have seen the back of him or a portion of him. It leads some people to think that when the angel of the Lord is coming and speaking and she says, I have seen God, that this is a theophany. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ because no one sees God except through Christ. And so did Christ appear to her? That's a possibility. But it seems that the, the thrust of this is, I have realized, I have perceived that God is here in time and space. He is real. He is real. That God is knowable. That God isn't an abstract idea or a concept or a force. He is God in spirit, but he has what we call personhood, meaning he has emotion, he directs, he is knowable. You can know him. And it's in God's great grace, not only that he sees her and he hears her, but he lets himself be revealed. That is grace. He could have seen her, blessed her, without her ever knowing who it was. But this is our great God that comes to people in love and care and says, I'm here. That part of the solution, part of the saving is that he makes himself known to us. 
And she calls the well, this is the well of the living one, the one real God, the true God. He's real. She says, this is the well of the living one who sees me. That is amazing good news. And she says that this is the God who sees me, and I have seen him. He hears me, and he looks out for me. He sees me in my sin and shame. He comes to me, and he still looks out for me, cares for me, blesses me. We know she returned home, and we know that when Abraham named the son publicly Ishmael, that means he accepted Ishmael as his son. And imagine this woman Hagar is going back with a testimony to Abram and Sarai. He's going back to these people that we're not listening, we're not trusting God, and she could say, I'm back and I'm here, not because of you guys, but because God has told me and I'm following his word. I met him in the wilderness and he is a God who sees us and hears us. He helps us and he saves us. That is amazing good news, isn't it? And if that God can find her in her sin and in her disobedience in the wilderness and he can see her and hear her and bless her, he can do the same as she submits and obeys and goes back to their house. He has revealed himself and she has responded. We see that there is a dire situation here. There is sin all over the place. Three people hurting each other in sin overstepping boundaries. In some sense, faithless towards God and his word and in disobedience, the place is a mess. The house is a mess. But God hears and God sees. God comes. And it just gets better. As good news as it is that there's an Ishmael, there's also an Emmanuel that God hears and that God is with us. Maybe today as you heard those words from the angel, from God's messenger to Hagar, because it's so close to Christmas, it struck you in a way. Does it sound like Luke 1 to you? The angel comes to this woman and says, Behold, you will bear a son and you will name him Ishmael. Then an angel comes to a girl named Mary and says, Behold, you will bear a son and you will name him Jesus. You will name him Ishmael, God hears. You will name him Jesus, God saves. What greater news. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary responds, how will this be? But I am your servant. Ishmael's God hears. Jesus' God saves. Ishmael was born out of humans' attempts at plan B. Jesus has always been plan A. Jesus did not come about because of the willpower of men or the effort of men, but that God was moving to do what he has always planned to do, to fix what happened in Eden on Calvary's cross. Ishmael is going to be this wild donkey of a man. Jesus is going to be the gentle man who won't even suffer a bent reed and will know no sin. Ishmael is going to be the father of a people. Jesus is going to be the king of kings over everything. What good news, isn't it, that Jesus hears us in our affliction, hears us in our affliction, hears us in our pain and in our suffering, and he comes to us to be with us and then to save us. He sees us. He sees us before we see him. He sees us dead in our hopelessness, dead in our sin, helpless to fix this, to put it back. And he comes. He finds us. We don't find him, but he finds us lost and running away from God, running in our sin, running in our shame, running in disobedience, And yet he comes to save us. God tells Hagar, you're going to have a son. 
But he told Abram, I am going to give you a son, and through these people I will bring salvation to the world. Jesus is that son. God gave Hagar a son, but the good news is he has given all of us his son. Amen? He's given us his perfect son. What danger we were in. Do you know it? Lost in sin. Trying to make our own way. We were in such absolute danger like Hagar in the wilderness. More danger than we even know. Danger of separation from God forever. Of dying of thirst and of hunger. God came. And God died to bring us back. He tells, the angel tells Hagar that God's going to look after her. He's going to give her a blessing and sends her home. And then we know our Lord Jesus who came. And he says that he has gone and made a home for us with him. A home where we are truly loved, fully accepted, never forsaken, never abandoned, never thrown out. A home with God. Because of what Christ has done. We see how Hagar responds. We see a little bit as the story goes on between Abram and Sarah how they will respond. Where are you going today? Where are you going today? It's a little bit of a blessing, even in this tough situation, that every time they call out at their house, even Abram and Sarai, they call out Ishmael, they can remember that God hears them. God hears them. We don't have children named Ishmael, most of us. But praise be to God, we have a Bible that we open and a Lord that we meet to in prayer, that we come to fellowship with brothers and sisters. And each time we do, we need to remind each other and be reminded from God, we have not only Ishmael, but we have Emmanuel, that God is with us, that God is not slow to fulfill his promises, that God hasn't forgotten us, but he sees us, he hears us, he cares for us. He saves us. 